This podcast is brought to you by listeners like you who have become patrons of the Irish History Podcast. You can become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Patreon allows you to pledge a small amount of money each month to support the show. In return, you will get lots of bonus content ranging from episode guides and extra patrons podcasts. So, after a poll of patrons last week, the next patrons podcast will delve much deeper into the story of the poor laws and Ireland's notorious workhouses. You can get that when it comes out by becoming a patron today at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Irish podcast. That's Patreon dot com forward slash Irish podcast. Throughout the series, I am thanking each individual patron with a shout out in the show. This week, I want to thank Ryan McCormack, Eileen Raymond, Matthew Reich, Aaron, Neil Riley, Frank Darcy and Hugh Kelly. Thanks a million, folks. The series wouldn't be happening without you. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWar and this is The Great Hunger Begins. As the title suggests, this podcast looks at the harvest of 1845 and the opening phase of the Great Irish Famine. As the last episode drew to a close, the hopes that 1845 would deliver a bumper harvest began to falter. The appearance of a mysterious disease on the potato crop was unnerving. However, with the harvest only weeks away, there was still reason to be hopeful the crops might be brought in before the disease could spread. This podcast looks at what happens in the following months as confusion reigned supreme. Were people aware of what lay ahead? What was this mysterious disease? How much did it affect the crop in 1845? And we will also begin looking at what will be a constant theme throughout the series. What was the British government doing to respond? The answers to these questions are not necessarily what you might expect, but it's all ahead of us, so let's begin. One hundred and seventy two years ago, Ireland stood on the brink of the greatest catastrophe in our history. In September eighteen forty five, a mysterious disease had appeared on potato plants along the east coast. In the twenty first century, this would certainly be very worrying for farmers who might face economic ruin, but in the nineteenth century, it was nothing short of terrifying for huge numbers of Irish people. Three million people depended on the potato for food. It didn't take a genius to figure out that if this disease spread, it could trigger a famine. In the event of something like this happening today, it would be nigh on impossible to avoid the inevitable wall-to-wall coverage. Just imagine it, every television screen, Facebook status, Twitter feed would be carrying updates in real time. News channels would provide constant coverage. In 1845, this wasn't the case. In the absence of modern communications, news in general travelled a lot slower. Finding out exactly what was happening was very difficult even after the disease began to spread and through much of September and October many across Ireland were completely unaware of the great dangers facing them. The levels of knowledge people had varied depending on who they were and where they lived. There was something of a cruel irony that those who faced the greatest risks and danger knew the least while it was arguably a man who was completely unaffected by the disease who was best informed. To try and get some sense of how the disease spread, what people knew and didn't know, we need to acquaint ourselves with that man who arguably knew more than most about the disease. Then we will return to the village of Inver in the west of Ireland, which we visited in part three, to look at how the community there, who probably knew very little, reacted. One of the best informed people about the disease impacting the potato crop in 1845 was the botanist Dr John Lindley, who had never visited Ireland up to this date and had shown little interest in events here. Born in 1799 in Norwich, England, Lindley was an accidental botanist. He had wanted to join the army, but his father didn't have the money to buy him a decent commission, so instead the young John studied botany, earning the title of doctor through his studies. While I don't mean to cause any offence to any botanists out there, Dr Lindley seems to have been a pretty dull character, the type of figure that everyone dreads getting stuck beside at a party. 
Wiley published lots of books, some of which sold well. They weren't exactly page turners. Somehow I doubt a natural system of botany had readers at the edge of their seats. However, in 1845, this man, working from an office in London, was among the earliest to realise the dangers facing Ireland. As editor of the Gardener's Chronicle magazine, he keenly observed the mysterious disease impacting potatoes since it first appeared in England in the summer of 1845. By August 16th, his magazine carried stories charting the disease's progress. With each passing week, Lindley devoted more and more space to the issue as potato blight spread through the north of England. While he still had little understanding as to the exact nature of the disease, he knew far more than most about it, based on reports he was receiving from gardeners across England. When he heard it had reached Ireland, Lindley immediately recognised the potential consequences for the Irish poor, who lived almost exclusively on potatoes. Although that week's Gardener's Chronicle had already gone to print, he stopped the presses to rewrite some of the magazine and insert the ominous question, where will Ireland be in the event of a universal potato rot? In retrospect, these are haunting words. However, the impact of his column was limited in Ireland in 1845. The Gardener's Chronicle had a circulation of around 6,500 readers. While it was possible to get the magazine by subscription in Ireland, what few copies did make it across the Irish Sea had a negligible impact on wider opinion. While Lindley sat in his office in London, increasingly anxious about what was unfolding, many of those in Ireland whose lives were on the line were almost totally oblivious. This was due to isolation, poverty and the peculiarities of the disease. Next, we will return to the village of Inver on the Atlantic coast, which we visited in part three, to see what the people there, who were totally dependent on potatoes, knew. In part three of this series, we visited the village of Inver, which is perched on a remote shore of the Atlantic Ocean in northwest County Mayo. In September 1845, the inhabitants of the village were probably looking forward to a bountiful harvest. Even when newspapers began to report the appearance of the disease on potatoes in the east of Ireland in September, most in Inver were almost certainly unaware of this news. The village itself was geographically isolated in its rugged isolation. However, aside from this, newspapers, and particularly those written in English, had a limited impact in this far-flung corner of Europe. While literacy rates across Ireland were rising fast, reaching nearly 50% by the 1840s, Inver and the wider region of Eris in northwest Mayo lagged far behind. Just over one in ten people could read, and even less could write. The resulting isolation from the wider world was exacerbated by the fact that many could not speak English, the language most newspapers were written in. While Irish was in decline almost everywhere else, when Caesar Otway visited the Inver region in the late 1830s, he noted that Irish was on the increase here at the expense of English. Therefore, while well, news and indeed newspapers inevitably drifted into the area from the nearby Coast Guard station at Belmullet, these surely had a limited impact at best. Literate members of the community may have read the news aloud for their neighbours, but much was undoubtedly lost in translation along the way. And even if they had heard news about the disease, there was little illiterate tenant farmers could do to find out more. There was no internet or government department to contact. So it was that few, if any, in villages like Inver, and indeed the wider region, had any sense of the terrible danger threatening them in September 1845. While the botanist, John Lindley, in London may have known the most, and the people of Inver were largely unaware, most Irish people were somewhere in between. From September onwards, they had access to reports about the disease and its progress. However, the information available to them was deeply confusing. For example, on September 23rd, the Freeman's Journal already predicted a famine, yet the Longford leader on the very same day predicted a grey crop that would provide plenty of food until the harvest of 1846. This confusing picture was understandable given the nature of the disease itself and how it manifested itself. Identified as the fungus Phytophthora infestans, Long after the famine, when it appeared in potato plants in Ireland in 1845, it was something of a mystery. The initial signs, tiny grey-green growths on the undersides of leaves, were almost unrecognisable. 
Unbeknownst to farmers, these were in fact fungus spores. Once the fungus germinated, it was deadly. While it grew on leaves, it reached the potatoes themselves, which grew beneath the soil, in two ways. Rainwater could wash the tiny spores through the soil onto the potato, where the farmer would be oblivious that their crop was under attack. Alternatively, during harvesting, when the potatoes were dug from the soil, the spores could then come in contact with them. Harvested potatoes were usually then stored in pits dug in the soil where the spores could take their deadly effect while the farmer thought they had a decent crop. In either case, once the disease took its toll, it turned the potatoes into a black, stinking, inedible, mushy substance in a short period of time. Due to this unusual way, the spores attacked the plant. It was difficult to get an overall picture. Farmers could get some sense about it when they harvested the crop, but most of this was not done until late October and early November. And even then, they would have to check their storage pits regularly to see if the blight was attacking the potatoes that had seemed sound. In this context, it's hardly surprising that the news was so mixed, depending on the source. However, it is fair to say that in general, there was no major sense that a crisis was unfolding until the second week of October at the very earliest. There simply hadn't been enough potatoes dug yet. Indeed, on Sunday, October 12th in Belmullet, a few miles from Inver, people's attentions there were far removed from the harvest or diseased potatoes. The highest profile politician of the day, Daniel O'Connell, was due to arrive in Castle Bar, a town about 70 kilometres away, to host a major meeting calling for a repeal of the Act of Union. Even though the movement for repeal was in decline, as we saw in the last episode, O'Connell could still draw large crowds, and many from Belmullet, including a local marching band, made a long trek south to join the parade through the crowded streets. There was no sign of an impending crisis even though many of those in attendance that day were the very people most at risk. However, while they may have been largely oblivious, by mid-October the British authorities in Dublin had grown increasingly concerned about the situation and began to take decisive action to try and confirm the exact extent of the mysterious disease. As we have seen, few, if any, had a clear picture of what was unfolding in Ireland in early October. The press had become increasingly useless, oscillating between glum portents of disaster and wildly optimistic predictions. However, the British authorities based in Dublin were increasingly alarmed about what was unfolding and knew they could not rely on such varied reports and put into motion a plan to find an accurate picture of how extensive the failure in the potato harvest was. As early as September the 16th, the Lord Lieutenant... Baron Hewtsbury, who we met in the last episode, had instructed the police to start sending in reports about the state of the crop in their local areas. This gave Hewtsbury the best overall picture, given the police had tentacles that spread across the island with a reach far greater than any newspaper editor. In the coming weeks, the administration based in Dublin Castle began to build up something of a more accurate picture. The first reports in early October indicated that the most optimistic reports seemed correct, But everyone knew the real litmus test was still a month away when the final harvest would be complete in early November. However, even long before this, Hewtsbury began to receive indications that a very serious situation was unfolding as the police began to file reports of high levels of disease in the potatoes already dug. By October the 15th, he made Robert Peel, the British Prime Minister, aware of this and by this stage Peel himself said... There can be no reason to doubt that the failure of the potato crop will be very general. While Peel accepted the reports from Ireland were alarming, he also claimed that the Irish had a tendency to disregard accuracy and exaggerate. However, back in Ireland on the following day of October the 16th, Baron Heatsby received even more dire reports. The police now told him that in 17 of Ireland's 32 counties, there had been major outbreaks of potato blight. By late October, it was clear the disease had spread through the entire island. On October 21st, it had reached Ballina, a large town only 50 miles to the east of Inver. However, while it was clear the disease had spread, the reports as to the severity of the outbreak continued to be contradictory. For example, in Swinford, a town near Ballina, panic spread in late October as merchants were said to be hoarding grain in the prospect of an imminent famine. 
However, then, later in November, further news from Swinford reported that the disease had eased, and with it, the general panic. Nevertheless, while it was unclear exactly how much of the potato crop was lost, the disease was spreading relentlessly. The fields around Belmullet, one of the most westerly points in Ireland, and only a few miles from Inver, were infected by November the 6th. It is accounts from here that give us a very personal sense of the impact of, of what discovering the crop had failed was like. One report began, A poor man residing in the town of Belmullet set a little potatoes, dug them and put them into a pit, and they were perfectly sound. A few days later he opened the pit, and, at the least, one half were totally rotten. By November, the anticipation and excitement that had prevailed in this isolated corner of Mayo at the prospect of Daniel O'Connell's arrival in Castle Bar only a few weeks earlier had evaporated. They now faced a very uncertain future. The best words are those from people at the time. This account again is from Belmullet. I cannot describe in language strong enough the frightful and awful alarm of the poor people. May God in his bountiful mercy avert such a disastrous calamity. You must conclude how panic-struck we are in this westward part of Ireland. To appreciate this panic, it's worth taking a moment to think about the anguish people must have been feeling when they opened potato pits to find the potatoes they had just recently harvested were turning into black, stinking mush that was completely inedible. For the poor, this wasn't just a lost harvest and financial hardships. They were looking at the food for the coming year and it had been destroyed. Eating infected and diseased potatoes was impossible. One person likened the smell that emanated from them when cooked to that of excrement. However, in October and November, the prevailing mood was not one of utter dejection just yet. It was still one more of uncertainty. While the disease had clearly infected the crop across the island, it had not destroyed the entire harvest, and no one had a clear sense of exactly how much food had been saved. Indeed, in late October, the price of potatoes in the Dublin markets remained stable. A steep rise, which would come, was the thing that ultimately starved the poor when they couldn't buy food. While people were increasingly anxious in towns, villages and farms across Ireland, the government in Britain were trying to move to get definitive answers. Exactly how much of the crop was lost? Could the harvest of potatoes, which were unaffected, be saved? And was there anything to be done with the partly diseased potatoes? For this, to Dr John Lindley, who re-enters our story. But before that, I want to take a quick break. Hi folks, thanks for taking time to download the show. I really appreciate it. This series on the Great Famine is only possible with the support of listeners like you who have become patrons. The support so far has been amazing and I've reached the $1,200 mark, 60% of the way to reaching the overall target of $2,000. Now when I reach that goal, I'm going to start making a documentary on the Great Famine that I've mentioned in previous episodes. The documentary though won't just be a straightforward history, but I also want to look at what the famine means to people today. Because... Already to the making of this series, it's become really obvious that it means very different things to different people. I will soon be starting discussions on Patreon for patrons about that documentary and what you guys would like to see in it. Hopefully I'll even be interviewing some of you for that. So you can become part of that by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Thanks for your support. Now, let's get back to 1845. By mid-October, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Robert Peel, decided to get definitive answers about what was happening in Ireland. While he would later turn to the question of relief and aid, he initially moved to establish a scientific commission of experts to travel to Ireland. For this, Peel enlisted the services of Dr John Lindley, of the Gardener's Gazette, given he was such a well-established botanist. Lindy was joined on this scientific commission by the Irish scientist Robert Kane and a Scot, Lion Playfair. For Lindley, a stranger to Ireland, he suddenly now found himself with huge responsibilities. If he could divine the cause of this mysterious disease, he could potentially avert the crisis unfolding. There was scarcely a more important mission he could have as a botanist. While Peel wanted them to ascertain the true extent of the disease, 
and how much of the crop it had affected. Lindley and his team were assigned two other key tasks. Firstly, they had to try and develop some method of protecting potatoes that had already been dug but were not yet diseased. And secondly, they had to find some way of using partially diseased potatoes. They quickly arrived in Ireland and no one can fault their work ethic. They were working by October the 24th and within 20 days they had reported to the House of Commons informing them that judging on their preliminary investigations the disease was as bad if not worse than had been reported already. Later Lindley and his team would actually exaggerate the extent of the disease predicting that as much as 80% of the 1845 harvest had been lost. This was a total overestimation and not necessarily a good thing because it confirmed the view in England that reports from Ireland were exaggerated, something that had dire consequences in later years. Nevertheless, in 1845, there are reports that the disease was widespread certainly brought home the message in Britain that something very serious was developing in Ireland. However, the rest of their mission was a dismal failure. Even though other scientists had identified the disease as a fungus, Lindley believed that the fungus was only a symptom and the actual cause of the blight was excess water in potatoes. This incorrect view formed the basis of the Commission's recommendations to protect harvested potatoes. Following logically from a belief that the cause was excess water, Lindley, Playfair and Kane recommended that already harvested potatoes could be protected by drying them in the sun and then placing them in shallow, well-ventilated pits. When they turned to the issue of using partially diseased potatoes, they recommended they should be pulped, the starch removed, and then this could be mixed with flour to make bread. These suggestions were widely publicised. 70,000 copies were printed and distributed through parish priests, while they were also carried in newspapers and abstracts were given to the local police. However, on both counts, the recommendations were more or less useless. While the ventilated pits did little or nothing to protect potatoes from blight, the removal of starch from diseased potatoes was totally unworkable. In a village like Inver, the poverty-stricken farmers would not be able to get their hands on the tools and equipment needed for this process. Furthermore, the nutritional value of the starch was pretty questionable. Overall, it's hard to see how the Commission, although they had arrived with the best of intentions, was anything other than a failure. The British government did not get an accurate assessment of what was happening, nor were their solutions useful. In later years, Lindley and his fellow scientists were comically lampooned by the Irish nationalist John Mitchell in a humorous but unfair quip. These learned men amongst them prepared so valuable and large a book that, if it had been eatable, the famine would have been stayed. In fairness, it was a pretty tall order to expect these three individuals to come up with a solution in the space of time given. As the winter of 1845 approached and all the evidence at this point now indicated that there would be a major collapse of the potato crop, the British government had to turn their mind and efforts to the issue of relief or getting aid to Ireland. No matter what happened, food was going to run short in 1846. Prices would inevitably soar and the poor would starve. Something had to be done. By late October, the question on everyone's lips increasingly turned to the question of aid and what would the government in Britain do? On several occasions, the authorities had intervened in famine situations and sent aid to Ireland, most notably in 1822, when government aid, backed by private charity, had staved off a famine in a time of great shortage. By the last week of October 1845, the government faced pressure from the reformed Dublin Mansion House Committee, a group formed in 1821 to raise money when famine had threatened. Its members in 1845 were some of Ireland's most well-known figures, including the Duke of Leinster, Lord Cloncurry, Daniel O'Connell and the Lord Mayor of Dublin, John Arabin. They drew up a list of demands for the British government, which was brought to the attention of Robert Peel in London and Baron Hewtesbury in Dublin. They called for the immediate opening of Irish ports to the importing of all kinds of human food tax-free. While this might sound sensible in a time of famine, in the 1840s this was about the most controversial thing a politician could say, but I will return to that later in the show when I talk about the Corn Laws. The committee also wanted a ban on exports of oats because while Ireland faced starvation, merchants in Irish ports were continuing to export food. For example, on November the 14th, 700 tonnes of oats were loaded onto a ship, the Jane Black, in the port of Limerick 
destined for the London markets. That was just one ship in one port. This was continually happening throughout these months. Other measures the committee wanted included a reduction in the amount of oats fed to the British Army horses in Ireland, a ban on the distillation of spirits that involved grain, a loan of £1.5 million to buy food, and a programme of relief works that would give the poor money. A delegation of the Mansion House Committee met with Baron Hewtsbury to give him these demands, and although he was a seasoned diplomat, he did little to inspire confidence that the government was taking the matter seriously. He first insisted the delegation travel to his residence in the Phoenix Park outside the city rather than meet in his office in Dublin Castle, a move which was considered discourteous. Hewtsbury then responded to the demands by reading from a prepared statement in which he argued for a wait-and-see approach. His manner was described as stiff and formal and did not strike the right tone given the situation. Overall, he provoked condemnation in the press. However, the impression of government in action Hewtsbury gave off was not accurate in 1845. Action was being taken in London by the Prime Minister Robert Peel. However, the unfolding crisis in Ireland was about to be drawn into a major debate at the centre of British politics, a very dangerous place for starving people to find themselves. Next, I'm going to properly introduce that man with the reins on power, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Sir Robert Peel, and look at what he planned to do. In 1845, the ruling party in the United Kingdom was the Conservative or Tory party, led by Robert Peel. The party of opposition were the Liberals, led by Lord John Russell. In 1845, many had reasons to be dubious about Robert Peel and whether he would take effective action. He had a pretty chequered past when it came to Ireland. He had served as Chief Secretary here between 1812 and 1818. But during his tenure, he had gained a pretty notorious reputation from a feud he had with Daniel O'Connell. However, after his return to politics in England, where he rose to the leadership of the Conservative Party, his once hardline views on Ireland began to change. By the 1840s, he favoured an amicable approach to Ireland in general, and specifically Irish Catholics. Not necessarily because he believed this was the right thing to do, but because he believed it was ultimately the best way to secure the union between Britain and Ireland. When he received the demands from the Mansion House Committee about stopping exports and opening ports to free trade, Peel's initial response wasn't inspiring though. His words, Public Public policy and public public duty prevent me from entering into a discussion with respect of particular measures sounded like political doublespeak. However, even his critics then, and most historians since, generally acknowledge his efforts were more effective than any other measures taken during the famine. In late 1845, Peel prepared a raft of measures, some of which he had very good reasons for keeping secret. He had identified spring 1846 as the crunch time when food would be needed. He planned to roll out relief measures that he would keep totally independent of the poor law and workhouses, as it was widely accepted that these institutions, designed to help the needy, could not cope with a famine situation. On November 20th, his government formed a temporary relief commission, to operate in Ireland under Edward Lucas, a civil servant, but he was quickly replaced by Randolph Routh from the British Army Supply Department, a man who will feature prominently in coming episodes. The remit of the Relief Commission was to establish depots for food imports and coordinate the work of voluntary relief committees springing up across the island. The food they planned to distribute through these depots was not going to be given away for free though. Instead, they planned to release it onto the market to stop the price of food soaring, which was what would ultimately see most people starve in a time of famine. Of these measures, it was a move that drew little attention at the time that had one of the longest lasting and terrible legacies. Critically, Peel gave the British Treasury a central role to oversee the entire distribution and control the money spent on all food. This allowed a hitherto obscure civil servant, the permanent undersecretary at the Treasury, a man called Charles Trevelyan, to wield huge control over Ireland in coming years. I'm going to return to this man and probably do maybe even a full show or at least half a show on him because he haunts the famine story like no other individual. But it's worth just marking that this is the point of where he enters the story. Anyway, in late 1845, with plans afoot to create depots, Peel now went about sourcing grain. 
Against the advice of the Treasury, he secretly secured £100,000 and organised the purchasing of what was known as Indian corn or maize. This actual purchase was carried out in secret by the international traders, the Barings Brothers, a predecessor of Barings Bank, which famously collapsed in 1995. You might have heard of it when a rogue trader, Nick Leeson, lost nearly a billion pounds. Back in the 1840s, Barings were perhaps somewhat more noble. They refused to take a commission for work they considered charity. While it would take months to buy this food in the US, the shipments, once they arrived, were estimated would only feed about a million people for 40 days, which clearly was not enough to make up for the crop failure if it turned out to be as bad as many were predicting in November 1845. However, Peel hoped that it would be enough to regulate the price of corn in Ireland and keep it at an affordable level. The entire process had to be carried out in secret because Peel rightly feared that many corn merchants would not sell onto the Irish market if they knew he was about to import large amounts of cheap corn. He also feared that it would undermine private relief efforts. While he set this in motion, he also moved on to the second part of his plan, which was far more controversial. This was the repeal of the Corn Laws. Now this takes a bit of explaining, but is really crucial to understanding the famine. It provoked high emotions and everyone had an opinion on this move. By the 1840s, most British politicians were committed to the idea of free trade and reducing all taxes on tariffs on imports. However, there was varying opinions on one item. That was grain. Legislation known as the Corn Laws more or less stopped the import of grains into the United Kingdom, which don't forget then included Ireland, by placing really high taxes on them. This obviously would have a huge impact in Ireland in the time of famine if grain couldn't be imported from outside the United Kingdom. These laws did benefit merchants and farmers because they raised the price of food, but for similar reasons they were not good for the poor. Now, by the 1840s, the opposition Liberal Party supported their abolition, as did Robert Peel, who had slowly come around to this position. However, his own Conservative Party were divided on the issue. Therefore, to repeal the Corn Laws would be very difficult and even dangerous for Robert Peel. It could easily bring down the government. And furthermore, the crisis in Ireland would be dragged centre stage in party politics in Britain. This didn't bode well. However, as we will see in the next episode, Robert Peel was determined to abolish the Corn Laws. In late 1845, millions in Ireland faced a very uncertain future. But it is important to recognise at this stage there was still hope. Unbeknownst to them, the agent of Barings Brothers in Boston, a man called Thomas Ward, was buying up huge amounts of grain in the United States and preparing to ship it to Ireland. Furthermore, reliable figures on the harvest of 1845 were finally being tallied and it was not nearly as bad as it had been initially predicted. The disease seems to have peaked sometime around December, with many areas reporting an overall loss of 30%. The worst affected counties, Armagh, Clare, Kilkenny Louth, Monaghan and Waterford suffered a loss of around 40%. Now this was unquestionably serious, don't get me wrong, but it was not unmanageable. The fact that the oat crop in 1845 had been bountiful further softened the blow. Nevertheless, there was grave reasons to be concerned about the year ahead. In the next episode, we will tentatively move in to the second year of famine, that is 1846, when a debate around the future of the Corn Laws sees the famine become a political football where there are few, if any, winners in Ireland. Until then, Sloan. And don't forget you can support this series at patreon.com forward slash irishpodcast and get your bonus content. 